Hey everybody, welcome to today's live stream. Uh, the topic of this week is Mendelian genetics, and let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my worksheet over here. I hope everybody's having a pretty good day. It didn't rain all day, which is great, so that's awesome for November. Alright, so this is a genetics vocabulary review, and down here we have some terms and definitions, and we are to match up what goes with what. So first, we have heterozygous, and just remember going through this that this can be an example or a definition, so it doesn't have to be exclusive, exclusively both. Heterozygous means different. Homo means same. So therefore, if we're looking for something different, E would be our heterozygous answer. Oh, sorry about that. For homozygous, it would be the opposite. And this could be either dominant or recessive, which means that you can see two of the same for either a capital letter or a lowercase letter, how it's usually denoted, which there's an example right here. I'm just going to cross the ones that we've done so far so we can keep track. The next one is monohybrid cross. And so with a monohybrid cross, the definition of that is just that there is a hybrid of two individuals with homozygous genotypes. So it's a cross between genotypes that are either like this or this. They just have to both be homozygous. And that's why that's why we say hybrid cross and mono is referring to a one allele, a one allele cross. So a definition of that we can find here. Blonde mates with brunette. If we're using B as our allele choice and brunette being dominant, a monohybrid cross would mean that the brunette looks like this and the blonde is homozygous recessive. Awesome, okay, autosomal. Autosomal basically means everything in the body except for sex cells. So an example or a clear definition would just be this one right here. Simply, it is not a, a sex cell, it's a self cell. I'm, I'm big on prefixes. I think that it helps memorization some. So I hope that is okay. Um, great, so the next one is genotype. This would be more so uh, looking for basically anything encompassing. So the general definition of a, a genotype is right over here in H. Homozygous and heterozygous are genotypes, but they're just specific. Um, heterozygous, we know that the genotype is specifically two different alleles, a big B, a little b, as we said for E. Homozygous is a, a specific term we use for genes that denote the same allele. So this general term over here, H, just refers to all genotypes. Next is phenotype. A phenotype is the expressing characteristic. It's what you see. Um, an example of this would be blue or brown eyes. So you can see when looking at somebody that they have brown eyes, and that is their phenotypic expression. Therefore, we can put D as our answer for phenotype. Okay. Next is the definition of a gene. And a gene specifically coincides with this answer here, F. It is a locus, a place, on a chromosome that codes for a given polypeptide. And remember that a polypeptide is simply a string of amino acids, um, and that can encode for proteins, mRNA, lots of different stuff. And a locus, if this is our little chromosome, it basically just means, if we were to highlight a gene could be like right here. It's just a, I don't know if you can see that yellow. Maybe I should choose a darker color. 
the locus would be right here, just a spot on the chromosome. Great. Allele is um, one of two or more forms of a given gene variant. So an example of this would coincide with I, where males have only one for each gene on the X chromosome. Awesome, that's I. And lastly, the only one that we haven't pointed to is A, but let's go through it. So we said earlier that a monohybrid cross was dealing with one gene. I should put big G, big G here. Is dealing with one gene that are both homozygous. A dihybrid cross is pretty much the same thing, except it's two genes. So we would have G, G, B, B, and G, G, B, B are examples. But both genes have to be homozygous. They don't have to be the same kind of homozygous. They can be little g, little g, big B, big B. It's just important that each one of these alleles in its own right is um, homozygous. So that is why blue-eyed blonde mates, which pretty much look like blue-eyed, we said blonde was B. Let's do um, G <laughs> for B, like we did in the last example. So <coughs> blue-eyed would be little b, little b. Blonde would be little g, little g. And then brown eyed brunette would then be big B, big B, big G, big G. Awesome. Okay. So, from a single cell going through meiosis, how many daughter cells are likely produced? If you were here last week or remember the details of meiosis, uh, we can say that four cells are produced. The next question asks, for your model organism or individual defined in question one, how many different kinds of gametes can be produced from a single cell undergoing meiosis? And we're to assume that there is no crossing over, which is pretty important because that opens up the possibilities. So just to draw this out, this is what it's saying. In meiosis, we know that these are going to split up. into haploid cells, haploid chromosomes I mean. Um, so it's asking for how many different kinds of gametes can be produced and we can just see here that these two are the same and these two are the same. Which means our answer is just two different gametes. Okay, this question is kind of split but um, the answer box is on the next page, so you'll see it soon. It says, your individual is heterozygous for two genes on separate pairs of homologous chromosomes. Their genotype is big C, little c, big B, little b. <clears throat> Given this information alone, how many different kinds of gametes could this individual produce? Again, assuming no crossover occurs. So in this case, I like to pair up So the gametes are basically saying, um, these are, with my black pen I'll draw like a little cell membrane around it, assuming that these are chromosomes, these are the cell gametes. Uh, these are the daughter cells, I mean. The gametes are, are describing the what these chromosomes encode for inside. So if this was a big B, big B, like that would be that. If this was a little B, little B we're seeing that there's only two different types of gametes. There's a big B and there's a little B, and that's what it breaks into four. The daughter cells are just referring to the amount that meiosis went through and the cells that were produced. Gametes are the information. 
I know I got kind of muddy there, but I hope that makes sense. If you need clarification, of course ask. And no, the form is not sent out yet. I like to wait a little bit just to make sure everybody gets here. It'll probably be sent around 5.30. Um, so yeah, awesome. Well, sorry for my throat. I was singing a lot today in the car and I think it's kind of going. <laughs> okay, so moving back to three. Um, we have big C, little c, big B, little b. And I just like to just break it up. So if I want to pair, kind of, it, kind of think of, about it like algebra when we were learning to go within the parentheses. So if I want to just like multiply the C in here, it can go with big B. It can also go with little b. We can do the same thing for the little c, where the little c can go with big B and little c can go with little b. And what that would look like is this. So as you can see, all of these are different. And so our answer for this would just be four gametes. Because this is one, two, three, four, and not one of them looks like each other. Question four. Compare your answers to the previous two questions. How do the numbers of different kinds of gametes in your answer compare and explain any difference? I think this answer is much easier when I draw it out, so I'll start explaining it a little bit and then I'll move to my notebook. Um, so any single cell that goes through meiosis, and we're assuming no crossing over because we did in those previous examples, produce, produces only two, two kinds of gametes like we said. So no, no genes are going to cross over, we're not switching any genetic information. So those gametes remain the same and only two are expressed in the four cells. Two types are expressed in the four cells. However, that individual does have the potential to produce four different kinds based on how the chromosomes line up. So to show this example, let's assume, let's just split this up into two parts. Part A, and part B. So let's say our chromosome where we have this is a chromosome, this is a chromosome, we have big B here, big B here, and then little b and little b on their chromosomes, and then this is kind of where they line up down here, and we see on this chromosome and this chromosome, big C, big C, these two, little c, little c, then what we get is that these come together, and then these come together. So this is what we said earlier and that they would only produce two gametes. The only two that we're seeing is BC and BC expressed. Those are only two. However, in B, if they lined up where this guy flipped, and we had little b chromosome and big B on the right side instead this time, imaginary line, and then our C's, and I'll um, put a little line underneath the little C so it looks, you can see visualize, it, visualize that easier. Um, but the C's are in the same place. Therefore, in this case, we get four different types, uh, two, um, two different types of gametes. So I guess I was leading you guys to think that there were four. I'm so sorry that that's where this is going. All this is trying to show is that depending on which way these line up, 
we can get like crossing over. And so if we're, if we're like having multiple chromosomes crossing over, we can theoretically express all of these four. So because of because the way that lining up is equally probable, this this can happen. I don't know what I'm drawing. <laughs> This guy, A, can happen just as likely as B. So, on average, four types can be produced. That's why we get the Punnett square, where we have, like, we have different chromosomes. We have a chromosome with B and little b. We have a chromosome with big C, little c. And we always draw it out like such. That is to determine... That, that is equivalent of the probability that we have just demonstrated here, where depending on how the chromosomes line up, we can have four different types of gametes. So that was this guy. Okay. What aspects of meiosis account for, one, Mendel's Law of Segregation? Mendel's Law of Segregation states that though each organism contains two traits or alleles for a given um, gene, only one allele is found in each gamete. Synapsis of homologous chromosomes in prophase one and their separation to opposite poles in anaphase one separate or segregate alleles of a given gene into different gametes. So we have, let's say, two alleles on its little thing. And this is a little chromosome. One allele is found on each gamete. And therefore, when they get attached to their spindle fibers that are on opposite sides, and they get pulled to opposite sides of the pole, they segregate into different gametes. So now these are separate. So though each organism alleles for a given gene only one allele is found on each gamete Next is asking about Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment, which states that pairs of traits that control e each other's character act independently of each other in gamete formation. So that, that is the assumption that these traits or alleles are on separate pairs of chromosomes, which basically is saying how one set of traits and one pair of homologous chromosomes segregates in gametes and how it does that for itself does not affect how another set of traits on a different pair of chromosomes segregate. If you have a chromosome over here and another blue chromosome over here, how this one chooses to separate and segregate has no effect on how this one separates independently. That's all that independent assortment is saying.
another separates. Great. Okay. This next part is more of a read through on how to attack genetics problems. Um, so it's saying that's just a set of rules and assumptions to make. Um, you can find further information in your textbook. It says right over here. So if you want to read more up on that um, other than this, then that's where to go. So first one is the assumption of gene linkage. Um, linkage has to do with determining the probability of crossing over events. Unlinked just means if these are two chromosomes, the genes are very far apart from each other. And linked means that they're super close. Unlinked can also mean that the genes are on different chromosomes altogether. And usually, um, you would assume that the genes are not linked. If they are linked, it will be clearly stated, but in general for this, um, for, for these genetics, it will be stated and you should assume that they are not. Um, is there a lethal allele? Oh, are the genes sex linked? Sorry. So if the problem does not indicate that the genes are sex linked, we are also to assume that they are not. So assume the genes are on autosomes and that they are not sex linked. Is there a lethal allele? Um, this will all, basically the redundancy through this is that like if there's any exceptions, it will always be given to you, so you don't need to um, you don't need to just play any guessing games. So we're assuming that they are unlinked autosomal and not lethal unless stated. And yes, I can see all your guys' comments. If it is lethal, then the offspring that gets the lethal the lethal allele does not appear. That they don't survive. Um, if if it's lethal that usually means that they they can't survive if they are given that which I think I said three times, <laughs> but that's okay. Okay, awesome. Um, it's also important to state that there are certain exceptions where this can happen later in life, but once again, exceptions are always stated. Great, okay, assuming if alleles are dominant, recessive, or neither. We know that big case letters are dominant and that lower case indicates recessive. Um, and that's usually the go-to. There's When there's co-dominance or incomplete dominance, um, they usually have a superscript, so these little guys up here will be indicated. And then how genotypes are written. We're assuming, assume a gene for fur color in hamsters is located on the number one pair of homologous autosomes. Brown fur is dominant over white fur. The genotype of fur color can be designated in different ways. Attendance is at 5.30 and no problem, I'll, I usually do attendance like half an hour in or later. Um, the alleles can be shown associated with the number one chromosome in this notation. So you can also see here that these alleles can be written where these lines are basically indicative of like chromosomes, kind of how I've been writing it like this. It's supposed to be a B but I'm using a highlighter. Um, but it's usually, we're, we're seeing it like this. That's, that's normally how we see it and how we've been using it. 
Um, and then with sex link jeans, it's going to look um, similar to co-dominance and incomplete dominance, but we're always just going to see, we're always going to see um, X or Y. These will always be there. X, 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 and X, Y will always be there. And then this is where up here, I know it's getting a little muddy, but that's where, um, I'll put this out a little bit. That's where you'll see where the genes are. Um, to write this clearly, this would be an example. Crossed with Okay, and then this is a summation of the information that we should need going forward. Um, gathering information. When you're reading a question, is it specifying what kind of cross it is, mono or dihybrid? Remember we said that that was indicative of homo homo zy homozygosity and that the di or mono had to describe how many genes. A di would have two different genes, mono would just have one. Are the genes sex-linked or autosomal? We always assume that the genes are autosomal unless specified as sex-linked, linked or unlinked. We assume that they are unlinked unless specified. B, what information provided tell, what does the information provided tell you about the genes? Um, so what are the different kinds of phenotypes that can result if there's more dominance? If it's a homozygous dominant with a homozygous recessive, we would only see the dominant. Um, how many alleles does the gene have? Like similar to up here, are there two alleles, just one allele that we're working with, that kind of thing. Um, is it co-dominant? Are there going to be more than just two expressions of phenotypes? Is it just dominant and recessive? Um, what kind of square are you looking at? And then, does the question talk about individual phenotypes? Parental information, grandparental information, gamete possibilities, offspring possibilities. Um, usually when you're seeing this, I don't know if y'all are familiar yet, but it looks like family trees where, you know, if it's a recessive gene and one parent is affected, it looks like this. And so you can do crosses right where we can say that all of the kids phenotypically show up uncolored um, like the colored in just means that they're affected that just denotes that so like they wouldn't show up if there's another box they wouldn't show up like this however we can know we know that all of them have this genotype cool For this case, um, I don't think that you guys are really going to need to know how to solve these or anything like that. Um, it's just um, it's just to give you guys like a visual of what they're meaning by grandparent information. This is these are the parents. These are the little guys. If the parents look like this, you will honestly just be dealing with Punnett squares. So I don't want to freak you guys out. But. If you take upper division genetics, you will get to figure these out, and it's honestly super fun, so I highly recommend. Okay, what is a Punnett square? Punnett squares are frequently used in solving genetics problems. Punnett square is a device that allows you to determine all the possible paired combinations of two sets of characteristics. For example, if you want to determine all the possible combinations of red, blue, and red, blue, and green shirts with red, blue, and green pants, you could set up the Punnett square like this. Great. I'm going to put the the form in the chat. And also, just so you guys know, I didn't clarify this on the last two um, for filling in the sheet, but I, uh, when I'm asking for instructor, I specifically need the Bio211 instructor so I can give it off to them. Uh, don't panic if you haven't um, filled in your specific instructor in the past. I have a spreadsheet of all of you guys, and um, when you fill out this one, I will obviously cross-check, and I'll fill all of that in, so don't worry about it. Um, just make sure you specify it on this one. 
That's all I had to say about that. Thank you. Awesome. So I'm going to be using pen to do crossovers. Um, if we have a red shirt in a punnet square, we're going to fill it into this box, and that just means that it's going to go all the way down in this row. Red pants, if it's in this row, we're going to see it crossing all the way through there. For blue shirts, blue shirts come all the way down here, and blue pants go all the way over here. And then green pants go all the way over here, and green shirts go all the way over there. So these points in which they're crossing over tells you the gametes you're producing and the phenotypes in this case, because you know if it's a green or red shirt. So hopefully that makes sense on like how to just go through and solve a Punnett square. If you guys have any more questions about that, let me know. Awesome. And then this is moving on to the same thing. Um, sorry, I want you guys to see. I keep going up too far. If you wanted to look at sex-linked, this is what the Punnett square would look like. Is you're, you're crossing XX and XY and you would have a pheno, uh, genotype, uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> an allele up here. And remember, the, the specific thing to remember for sex-linked is that we don't get an allele for Y because Y is never expressed. When you hear about examples of uh, red-green color blindness and how it's mostly common in those who are genotypically male, it's because they only have one X chromosome. And so if you get one little a, then you will have um, color blindness. So that, that's how that works. Number eight, if you know the parents' genotypes, how can you determine the type of offspring they will produce? In autosomal genes that have the alleles A and A, there are three possible. A can go with big A, A can go with little A, little A can go with little A. And so this, moving on to the next one, if we have these three possibilities, this is how um, we determine that cross. So our last example, the answer to it, was a simplified version of what we're seeing here where we can get these three. And we can cross big A, big A, with big A, little a, therefore, because we the ones that we're asterisking are exceptions, we can have this homozygous with this, homozygous, homozygous, and then another, uh, so sorry, homozygous, heterozygous, 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 and then homozygous, heterozygous once more. So it's important to note down here that if you take sex into account, there is going to be only nine possibilities because of male and female genotype seen here. So how we said A goes down like this and like that. And so this is what the whole filled in Punnett square looks like. It can be kind of daunting at first, but don't get too lost in the weeds with it. Um, really take your time and just go through and look at all of these crosses and just make sure that you have those correct and just really try to break it up into a lot of steps. I always found that the most helpful when I was going through this. And as we denoted um, up top and how I keep writing it like this, You'll also commonly see it like this, where the plus is kind of just an addition. It basically means the same thing as this. If it's present or not present is um, what coincides with the allele, but we're in biology. We like to make things a little bit more complicated when it's really saying the same thing. 
We're going to see examples of the possible combinations of these on the next page similarly, where you'll see in um, Y there's never a gene expressed in either of them. That is the only true difference between the two. And just to remember, if genes are on separate chromosomes, then they assort independently in meiosis. And so to solve a genetics problem involving multiple genes, you have to solve for each gene separately. And that's when, um, what I mean when I keep saying just like break it up into two. So for example, in this question, what's the probability that two individuals of the genotype AA BB and AABB will have any little a, little a, little b, little b offspring. So I like to break this up into two where we're just doing a cross with the A's as we're seeing down here and then we'll just do a cross with the B's. So we see here that what we're looking for is little a, little a, little b, little b. Half the time in this box from this cross we're going to see little a, little a. That's the probability of seeing little a, little a. For b, the probability of seeing little b, little b is only one fourth out of this. And so to solve for the probability of getting these two combined, we just have to combine those two numbers and that would be our probability. So that's what it says here. Alright, now this is just kind of a fill in the blank. Uh, determine the kinds of gametes in each one. So for this one, we only see one big A. This one, we only see one little A. In this one, we actually see two. I'm just gonna, I always make things so complicated. I practiced beforehand too. <laughs> okay. C1, big A, one, little a, two, big A or, or little a, for this one, there would be two, big A, big B, or little a, little b, in this one, four, big A, big B, big A, little B, little A, big B, little A, little B. All right, here, What do you mean by X in between the genes? Do you mean like when I um, when I do this? Is that is that that X? All that's saying is that we're crossing the two. So that's just how I write it. So I hope that makes more sense. Um, for F, we would see four, because we could have big A, big B, big C, big A, little B, big C, little a, big b, big c, little a, little b, big c.
these are all in equal proportions just so you guys know and in G this one would have 8 so to write them all out we would have basically this exact same thing except just replace this big C with a little c so I'm just going to write the little c component um, and so this one now we're getting like huge and I know that it looks daunting but we actually just to answer 2 and h in the same because there's no way we can draw this out our equation is 2n where n is equal to the number of heterozygous alleles. So in this case we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 2 to the 6 is going to be 32. So then to answer this again, it would be 2 to the n where n is equal to 4. So 2 to the 4 is 16 different gametes. Okay, and then it asks what these gamete, gametes are. So I'm going to go back to um, my notebook to draw this out because I think that it looks, it'll look cleaner that way. Um, we're looking for it possible in this. I'm just going to rewrite what we have. Okay. Sorry, everybody, if you didn't see. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, to answer your question, yes, yes, yes. So this. Oh, sorry, I was reading too far ahead. This is not the same as this. <laughs> it's just that the answer to this is 32, and I also don't want to draw it out. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so, sorry, to answer your question, I was just making sure I had it right, um, is that a chromosome is a structure in the nucleus that contains DNA. And it contains proteins and other structural proteins while a gamete is a reproductive cell that only has half the usual amount of chromosomes. So they contain half the chromosomes in a normal diploid cell that are known as somatic cells. Basically like a gamete is just like we have um, a chromosome that looks like this, right? But if this were to be halved 
there's a gammy and there's an allele on the gammy. Awesome, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so going back to the Punnett square. To find all these out, I like to cross two at a time. So I'm going to do A and B and C and D. We have two alleles and for this one I'm not going to, um, and yes, sorry, a gamete is half of a chromosome. I didn't see that. I started moving ahead. But yes, and of course, anytime you have questions, please ask. That's what I'm here for. Um, yes, gametes are haploid. Haploid means half of a chromosome. Yeah, that's totally right. Um, in this case, we don't need to write um, it 2 by 2 or 4 by 4. It's easiest just to do big A, big, big A, little A, big B, little B, and we know that we can do this. and this, and then similarly with C and D, you get this. So if we were to cross these, having A, B at the top, A, B possibilities, rather. I'm gonna, I like to make it so that it looks like this, actually, with my B's first. Oh, shoot. Okay, I, um, I'm going to finish showing this out and then I'll totally explain it. It's not, I promise you, it's not um, as scary as it looks. What I'm doing is just breaking these up into two bits to make it easier to look at. We're crossing this with itself. We're not saying um, that we have this times this. The way that we solved this, remember, was the probabilities, where we just did these crosses. We said, what's the probability of getting that gamete? What's the probability? When we're crossing these, it's usually just to answer a question of, like, when are we going to get this? I, I doubt, I highly doubt that your professors are going to make you just draw a huge pennant square. This is just to so that you can visually see where all these combinations are coming from. So please don't cry. <laughs> okay, I'm going to write it in a different color. I'm just going to go across now. Okay. <laughs> cool. So 
So this is our Punnett square, 4 by 4, 16 possible. And that answers this question. And so the next question is asking, if we completed a Punnett square, how easy would it be find to, to find the offspring of all, so how easy would it be to find all the offspring squares that contain the genotype? So basically the answer to this, and yes, so no, yeah, sorry. Um, today, because we have Veterans Day on Thursday and it's a holiday, it's on Tuesday, and then on in week eight, it's still on Thursday, and then for Thanksgiving, it's on Tuesday again. So whenever we're having a holiday on Thursdays, I'm just moving it to Tuesdays, but they usually stay on Thursday. And thank you guys for answering each other's questions in the chat. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, but even, even the key says this. All it says is very hard. <laughs> this would not be easy. Because of the amount of error that could happen, I mean, you guys saw how long it took me to make that other pennant square, and even then, I kept second-guessing where the C's and D's were. So, just, this is to reassure you that this stuff is not easy, and it takes time, and that it, it can be very tedious. The last question says, given that the genes are all in separate pairs of homologous chromosomes, what other methods could you use to determine the probability of these individuals having any offspring with the genotype this? So, this is an example that I was, um, kind of talking about earlier, where we're crossing these two. And how I was encouraging y'all to break it up. So, I'm going to cross these. these with each other, these with each other, and finally the D with each other. If we were to do all these Punnett squares, we're looking for, just to clarify, The one that we want to find looks like this. And this is what I was talking about with the probabilities. So when we cross heterozygous A, half the time they look like the one that we want. If we cross the B's, half the time in this Punnett square they look like the one that we're looking for for C only a quarter of the time they look like what we're searching for and finally for D similar to A and B It looks like what we want half the time. So to get the probability of having this specific genotype, we multiply the probability of finding each individual one by each other. So one half times one half times one fourth times one half. And that gives us one thirty second. Cool. That 
brings us to the end of the live stream. Does anybody have any questions while I'm still here? Awesome. Great. Well, don't forget to fill in the form and get that credit. Make sure that you put the last name of your instructor, all that jazz. Yeah, of course. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you guys all for coming and participating. I really appreciate it. See you guys next week. Thank you. Have a nice Thursday off.